Hey folks, so I'm here with my friend George Earhart. We're in my lovely Brooklyn apartment on this lovely afternoon. We decided we were going to talk about the politics of Western movies and the cowboy myth and all of that and what it really means in U.S. culture and U.S. history. So why don't you start us off, George? What do you think? Well, there's a lot of ways to approach this and a number of them are valid. I think you, the, one of the most important ones is the Civil War and in American culture, replacing the Civil War with an optimistic idea of expansion, getting away from race as something that is fundamental to American history. It, race becomes a kind of secondary otherness. You see that with the depiction of the Native Americans. And there's this idea that this expansion in, an, in, a, in a way that sanctions inequality will just lead to an expansion of happiness that people will find their happiness in the frontier. And is, there's some kind of wound there. And people are trying to get away from something in their present, deep in their history. Well, there's that phrase, go west, young man. Uh, that was, I, I forget, it was some very famous American scholar said it. And it's this notion that the United States is always expanding. There's always new opportunity just over the horizon. That seems to be a big part of the Western myth. It feeds into the Horatio Alger kind of uh, narrative, right? That, that America is a land of opportunity where everyone can get rich um, and go out west, settle the untold land. Uh, there's, a, there's that kind of, you know, a man's house is his castle, you know, out in the wild, unsettled land, and, you know, every man for himself, the pioneer thing. Is that what you're alluding to? Yeah, I think the Turner, I think it's called the Turner thesis about the frontier in American life. Even if it's wrong, is something in history that's significantly wrong. It's important, even if it's wrong. It, it, it gives a self-conception that it's hard to mesh with the present, that I still see if I like flip through a television, things alluding to another frontier. It could be Alaska, somewhere for us to have this. And losing this idea of the frontier to Americans is a kind of an amputation. And there's a fear about it. Even if it was necessary for life, there's this real fear about losing this idea, and it is being lost. And I think that has some relevance to the future. Well, what I think is interesting is, you know, the music that's played in many different Western movies is the music of Aaron Copeland, right? Uh, he did, you know, Simple Gifts, uh, Appalachian Spring, he did Hoedown, you know, they play in every cowboy movie, dum -da -dum, blah, blah, blah. you know, and, and Aaron Copeland, uh, even though his music is considered to be super American, um, it's almost like semi-patriotic music, practically. I mean, if you listen to it, you think this is the Pioneers, this is the Cowboy movie, this is, you know, Wild West, Go West. You listen to it, Aaron Copeland was both Jewish, gay, and a member of the Communist Party USA. Um, uh, it's not confirmed he was a full member, but he was a fellow traveler, he spoke at their events, he was a sympathizer, uh, you know, I mean, and, um, you know, he was part of that Roosevelt milieu, and it seems like the Wild West myth actually was something that a lot of the Communist Party USA, Roosevelt, progressive kind of wing of American politics in the 30s really bought into. And if you read Anna Louise Strong, one of my favorite writers, my favorite journalists, um, you know, her mo multiple of her books, I mean, The Stalin Era, I Change Worlds, The Remaking of an American, The Soviets Expected, it, there's all these analogies comparing the Soviet Union uh, and the Soviet people as they're going out and building new steel mills and electrifying the country to pioneers, right? And that she compares the, the go west young man and the American spirit, uh, you know, of, of the United States with the Soviet Union's uh, attitude during the 1930s and the five-year plans and Stakhanovism and all of that. Um, and I think that's particularly interesting as well, um, you know, that, that there was a progressive spin on this, right? We always think of the Wild West as being, you know, racist settlers killing Native Americans, plenty of that. Uh, we always think of, you know, the cowboy idea, nobody gave me nothing, I'm a self-made man, nobody gave me welfare, I don't care about nobody, you know. That's what we associate with Westerns, we associate them with, the, with this kind of Cold War right-wing politics. But interestingly, there was an attempt to put a progressive spin on that at one point, and I think that's interesting, and you would never do that now because of the killing of Native Americans and such. Well, in, in some ways, um, a lot of Marxism has emphasized the idea of historic progress that does have a price. Mm -hmm. And the West, in some ways, it was, I think, maybe especially untenable here, but there's a certain desire you see in the films where the fiction is kind of an aspiration to overcome a kind of alienation. 
that you see the cowboys, part of them always being made white when that's not historic. They're often black, often mestizo, uh, you know, is I think an overcoming of an alienation that the white man in this context has to be fundamentally an agent of labor. Hmm. And there's kind of a, a, you know, and I see that a lot of people who would never get on a horse, you know, were very interested in these movies. I think there's this, it, this fantasy breaks the alienation of life and the division of labor. Well, you know, there's two particular stories that I think Western movies really fixated on. The first being the showdown at the OK Corral, Tombstone, Arizona, Wyatt Earp. The second being Jesse James, uh, the, you know, the outlaw. And both of those stories, I mean, the Jesse James one is pure historical fiction. I mean, the way it's been retold in Western movies, Jesse James was a pro-Confederate activist after the Civil War in Missouri who went around robbing banks and he robbed railroads and symbols of Northern economic power. Uh, there were prominent politicians and like state legislatures that passed resolutions supporting him. He was not, you know, a people's bandit, you know, robbing the rich to feed the poor. He was very much a Confederate activist. Um, one of his robberies, he even wore Ku Klux Klan masks uh, as the Ku Klux Klan was starting in Tennessee to make a political statement. He wore Klan masks. He was a, he was a former Confederate guerrilla fighter in Missouri and Kansas who, as the war ended, continued engaging in armed theft and robbery before ultimately being killed. Um, you know, and that was Jesse James, but it's been rewritten to be the story of robbed from the rich to feed the poor, and, you know, it's, it's this Robin Hood story, to the point that, you know, there's the song, Jesse James, uh, that was a popular folk song, and that, uh, that actually, uh, Woody Guthrie even rewrote it to be about Jesus Christ, to the same tune, instead of Jesse, Jesse James was a man, you know, he, he did it as Jesus Christ was a man, so, you know, there, there's, there's this weird kind of, you know, uh, image of Jesse James being rewritten, and that's very interesting, now, the whole Tombstone thing, you know, that was a very small incident, the showdown at the OK Corral, but we've seen it on screen multiple times. I mean, there's been so many movies about it, from, I believe, the first one was My Darling Clementine, which came out just after the Second World War ended. It was a favorite movie of Harry Truman. Um, and then, after that, you had, you know, many, many, The Hour of the Gun, and, you know, all of them up to, like, Tombstone that came out in the 1990s. That's the story of, like, there's, there's a new sheriff, Wyatt Earp, who comes to town, and there's this gang, the Clanton brothers, that are terrorizing everyone. Um, you know, in, in the My Darling Clementine, there's a Shakespearean actor who comes to town, and they disrupt his performance because they're uncivilized barbarians who can't appreciate Shakespeare. So Wyatt Earp decides he's going to go to the OK Corral and, and show down, and he needs the help, then, of Doc Holliday, uh, who's an old man who's drinking himself to death and is dying of liquor disease. But, you know, he, Doc Holliday says there's no hope, there's no point in trying to fight the bad guys. But finally, Doc Holliday shows up, the old man who believes there's no hope and saves the day. And this is a, a, a Western movie that's been made many times. I understand it was a novel shortly after it happened. It was widely publicized in a lot of novels. They picked it up. They turned it into so many movies. Um, I think it's saying something. I mean, it has something to say, right? This image of the lawman coming to civilize the wild country, uh, the old man who has lost his hope and his, his ambition is inspired to rescue the younger man who still believes. It's a, got a lot of that American dream in it. It's also got a lot of that kind of imperialistic America is the, 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 the you know, policeman of the world. We're going to go bring law and order to the uncivilized people and rescue the world from the bandits. You can see a lot of American politics in that OK Corral story, wouldn't you say? Yes, I, I, I see that. And I, I see some other things where it's a, a major political statement I take in America that the West is kind of, uh, going back in the way to the Civil War and the, the state politics that were so important, the, the politics of having, you know, government in a way that they were of a certain kind, that people like the idea of being non-ideological anarchists hmm. when their lives are not, in the society they live in, are really not a reflection of that. Yeah. And there's a kind of seduction in political anarchism, no. But this kind of this kind of open free space for a kind of individual anarchism, it's it seems to be a consuming thing in these movies. I, I don't know exactly a hundred percent what to make of that, but that seems to be and I think I suspect that has a lot to do with the death of the, the genre, that it's no longer tenable. Like there you can't even fantasize getting away from bureaucratic life. Well, and the thing that you have to talk about is Leo Strauss, 
Now, Leo Strauss is considered to be the ideological father of neoconservatism. He's a philosophy professor. He was in Germany, and he was corresponding with Carl Schmitt, who was the main legal scholar of, of the Nazis. Uh, he then came to the United States as they were persecuting Jewish people in Nazi Germany. He was part of the New School for Social Research. Eventually found his way to University of Chicago. Paul Wolfowitz studied under him. Many prominent neoconservatives studied under, um, under Leo Strauss. And it's widely reported that Leo Strauss loved the movie, you know, the TV program, rather, Gunsmoke. He loved Gunsmoke. And, you know, Gunsmoke is famous for being the most corny, hokey, melodramatic 1950s Western, where the good guy wears a white hat and is completely infallible. The bad guy always wore a black hat and had no redeeming qualities whatsoever. Uh, the good guy always triumphs over the bad guy. Good versus evil. Good always wins. The bad, the good guy is Dudley Do Right, and he's always smiling. The bad guy is Snively Whistlash, a black hat and an evil mustache. Mwah -ha -ha -ha. And that that Leo Strauss told his students that average Americans should come to understand politics like it was an episode of Gunsmoke, um, and that that reality is much more complex. But it's for the elite to work out the complexity. That and he would draw from Plato the concept of the philosopher kings who are smart enough to rule, um, drawing from Plato's Republic and such. And, uh, you know, and that seems to be, you know, that, that particular brand of thinking, you know, is very much neoconservatism. Um, and it's this idea that, that Westerns, with their, you know, melodramatic 1950s, that, that's a way of understanding. And what's weird is, it's not weird, but to show, I, I think this points toward the influence of Leo Strauss, is that neoconservatism brought us cowboy presidents. Right? Ronald Reagan was a cowboy actor who became president. If you watch him from the Oval Office, he talks like a sheriff rounding up a posse in a movie. The communists are down there in Nicaragua, and we're not going to let them get away with it. No, we're not. I, Ronald Reagan, am going to rescue America from the communists. Right? You know, and, you know, and George W. Bush then comes in, and he's like, we're going to find Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. We're going to smoke them out. We're going to smoke them out. You know, and, he, you know, and it's like very much playing into this, you know, president as, as a military hero cowboy, right? Well, that's um, kind of the funny thing in that, in that kind of framework. Uh, Reagan was a B-movie actor, but Bush was more the, the B-movie president. Yeah. He was more like the, the made-for-TV version of Reagan in that sense. But, there, I mean, it's, in some ways it goes to, um, uh, it sounds snobbish, but there's a kind of idea... I've noticed that like a, a truncation of the intellect in American life where people are very passionate about freedom provided it's bereft of a certain level of psychological complexity. Mm -hmm. So the, the Western emphasizes agency, but it is not the kind of questions of agency that you would see in Shakespeare. It's much less complete. Yeah. And that's sort of like the Western, There's a it's about autonomy, but so much doesn't arise. It's, it's a world idea is like largely bereft of positive freedom. You're in the middle of nowhere and you're free to be in that nowhere and kind of fill it with your own divinity. Now, now Marxism influenced uh, Western movies, right? I mean, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know that if you're an average person who just watches Western movies. But if you read the scholarship and the analysis and the writing, um, and especially a lot of the cultural criticism, it's, it's widely understood that, that Marxism had an influence. But I think even the influence on Marxism, of Marxism on Western movies is quite interesting. Now, The Magnificent Seven, that was an American remake of the movie Seven Samurai from Japan. It was a hit movie from Japan, The Seven Samurai. They remade it as a Western. And I've talked about it many times in different, you know, lives and, and videos and such. But, right, The Magnificent Seven, right, you know, it's this... this town full of very, very short uh, Mexican villagers. They're being oppressed by a group of bandits that come and rob them once a year. So they send uh, someone to, to find, you know, some, some cowboy heroes to protect them from the bandits. Um, and then seven guys come, uh, and they're teaching the people in the town how to fight back and how to build barricades and do everything they can to fight the bandits that come once a year to rob them. Um, but over the course of doing that, the people in the, in the village discover that the men have kind of lied about who they are. So they feel demoralized. The bandits are coming. They think, oh, we've been tricked. The men are not the heroes they turn out to be, and they're going to be robbed. But then the people of the village fight back anyway, and they realize that all along they didn't really need the Magnificent Seven. They didn't need these cowboy heroes to do it. They could do it themselves. They had the ability to defeat their oppressor themselves, but it was the Magnificent Seven that came and gave them hope. 
right? And that, you know, that's that's the plot, and and that's an analogy. It's widely understood that, you know, the filmmaker who made the original Seven Samurai that it's based on, it was an analogy for the role of the vanguard party, right? The proletariat does not need, uh, does not need the vanguard party, but it's not aware of its own strength. The vanguard party shows the proletariat that they are capable of overthrowing the bourgeoisie, uh, and and it makes them aware of their own strength, and they can defeat their oppressor. That's a Marxist analogy. And if you watch Magnificent Seven, which was very popular in the Soviet Union, from what I understand, uh, not uh, the Seven Samurai version at least, you know, it, it's Marxist, but it's very optimistic, right? These people are being bullied and oppressed by these bandits, and they're you know they're full of hope. The good guys win, the bad guys lose. It's it's a Western, right? It's melodramatic, it's happy, it's optimistic, and it's empowering, and and it's Marxist, right? I mean, that was a Marxist-influenced Western. But go up to the 1970s. Magnificent Seven was the 50s. Go up to the 70s, and the Marxist-influenced Westerns that, that were around at that time are the Spaghetti Westerns, right? I mean, we're talking uh, Clint Eastwood, Hang 'em High, A Few Dollars More, Fistful of Dollars, uh, you know, good, the bad, and the ugly. That's all. Those, those movies are also reported to be very much influenced by Marxism. A lot of these directors and writers were affiliated with the Italian Communist Party, and so these are Marxist movies also. But they have a very, very different vibe to them, right? If you watch Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, you know it's Marxist in the sense it's showing people being corrupted by greed, right? The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. These people are desperate for this treasure. Human beings are greedy and torturing each other and brutal and killing each other and ready to die. You know, the, the theme song for the end right before the big shootout is called The Ecstasy of Gold. And it's like these three guys are going to have a standoff because they want gold so much and they're greedy and they're in a graveyard. And it's like greed is leading us to our destruction. That's kind of what you're getting from it. And that's Marxist in a sense, but it doesn't have any optimism. It's very dark. Right? It's very, very, you know, hopeless. It has a very negative view of humanity. And, you know, I mean, these writers affiliated with the Italian Communist Party are writing it, you know, Marxist scholarship, uh, you know, the whole Frankfurt School thing and Marxist, Marxist influence on art in Europe is going on at that time in the 70s. Even in the United States, you're still coming out of the 60s and there's protest movements and stuff. But what's interesting is that was a different, it was almost a different brand of Marxism. That was the new left. And it has that new left pessimism. And the Italian Communist Party, I mean, in 1978, they officially cut ties with the Soviet Union. They became Euro-communists, right? They, they didn't like the Soviet Union anymore. They thought the Soviet Union was an authoritarian, evil dictatorship. They saw the Italian communism as being separate, uh, along with, I believe, like the Spanish Communist Party, the French Communist Party. They, they gradually moved away from the Soviet Union and from Marxism, Leninism, and became more kind of social democratic organizations that while they, they didn't favor an attack on the socialist countries, they also didn't sympathize with them and they were much more reformist and I think you can see that pessimism influence those movies as well. The image that you get from these Marxist writers of spaghetti westerns is is not a good image. It's not optimistic, it's not happy, it kind of sees the world in a dark, dark place and I think that reflects the pessimism that gave birth to Euro-communism. You may be right about that, I'm not expert, but it's kind of interesting that there's kind of a progression in the storytelling that seems to have a vitality even when the, I wouldn't say the West is gone because in some ways is um, rich people moving to Arizona is slightly infused with the myth of the West even like mm -hmm. it, it's not entirely lost vague things that at first glance you wouldn't think there's still a little bit of a, like a quantum of the myth of the West but the the storytelling seems to have taken on a life that on the whole is not particularly left in that there was a lot of class struggle at certain points in, in, in the West, especially pertaining to the railroads, the mining, and very st stories that would actually be of, uh, in labor history, significant stories, and they're not, they're always second string to the individualist right. stories. You know, stories that are major stories of American history, but they don't, they may register in American history, but they don't, register in the story of the West? Well, for example, the Wobblies were very much a Western phenomenon, you know, around 1900, which is, I mean, that's later than the Wild West period, but you had a lot of people who were wandering workers going from town to town in Idaho and Utah and Seattle and or in, in Washington State and Oregon and California and 
places like that who were very badly treated. And that was the Wobblies started as a way to organize these traveling workers. A lot of them who were from like uh, Finland and Norway and places like that that were immigrating to the United States and were going from town to town and, you know, were very badly treated, um, wouldn't get paid and stuff like that. And that was how the Wobblies began. And, you know, that Bill, Big Bill Haywood was in Colorado with the, the miners. Right. And that was, you know, they were out there with their rifles. They were wearing cowboy hats. They were living in tents. They were having shootouts with the sheriff. I mean, it was everything you would think of with a Western, except there's no talk about that. People don't associate that with the West. I think that's what you're getting. They're at. always it's always like a kind of background it, to the it's it's just a given. No, no argument given why the story of this lone cowboy is more important than this background activity of the railroad workers, of the miners. Uh, there are exceptions to this. I remember like the, the, the TV movie Kung Fu with James Carradine. I think he basically organizes the Chinese rail workers and that's in the seventies. Hmm. And you know, they're like in the seven, you see like revision in the story, but it, it, it's a little pessimistic. It seems like revision doesn't lead to much excitement about the West. It may be, people come to terms with it in some measure and they move on into other areas of fantasy. Like the superhero movie, it seems the fantasy is so far away, it's safe. The stakes are so high, there aren't any. Well, That's you know, kind of what I see. The other thing that I think is interesting is as someone who's traveled and as someone who has met with people, you know, in other parts of the world, you know, and, and talked to them about the United States and U.S. culture, there is a fascination with Native Americans. And that comes from the Western movies, right? I mean, you know, the amount of, like, you know, mini documentaries you'll see on international television about Native Americans, be in, in Alaska or, in, you know, out West or wherever, like modern Native Americans, these are the Native Americans. The international community is fascinated by Native Americans, mainly because they saw them in Western movies. And, you know, Western movies really, I mean, a lot of Native Americans talk about how their image was just completely distorted, right? I mean, they talk about the drums that go bum, 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 bum. They, they didn't do that. The drums were a heartbeat. It was, you know, I mean, everything about Native Americans was kind of distorted. And it's interesting, like Peter Pan, for example. This is a British children's play and novel that comes out in like the 1800s, right? And it's, they've got Never Never Land, which is this fantasy land that Peter Pan lives, lives in, right? But yet Native American Indians show up. You know what I mean? Because it's like Native American Indians were so much a part of the culture. You've got pirates, which are you know, pirate stories, swashbuckle, and you've got Native American Indians uh, in this fictional land, because that's how much, because of the Western genre, because of the cowboy thing and the dime novels and, you know, that Native American Indians, I mean, you don't see aboriginals from Australia, for example, showing up in, in children's books in fantasy lands. You know what I mean? You don't see... Uh, you don't see indigenous islanders from the Pacific, but it was like Native Americans became such a such a kind of cultural icon that people all over the world know about Native Americans, but they have this image of them that has really been crafted by Hollywood. And I think that's particularly and interesting even, as well. Even it became so powerful, my impression, in the grip it had in Germany for a time, and still there's sort of a subculture of intense interest in some maybe stronger than the U.S. in a way. Uh, for under, I, I don't know a lot about this, but I think Carl May, I'm not going to mispronounce his name, there are writers who wrote about the West, and there was a kind of fascination, and it was a place that you may never have been to, but it you didn't have to be in the West to be involved in the mythos of the West. And you can almost see the beginning of the hippie thing with the way Westerns, even though they they portray the Native Americans in a very offensive way, there's still kind of a weird, odd respect within it. Have you noticed that? Like, they portray them as, as on some level, they're noble. They have these ancient mystical ways that are interesting. And the way that hippies in the United States, the 1960s, eventually latched on to Tibetan Buddhism, to, to Hare Krishna stuff, to all kinds of Eastern mysticism, you can almost see the beginning of that in the way Westerns have this odd, despite the fact that Native Americans are being portrayed in this racist, stereotypical way and talking in offensive ways. and I mean, everything about it is, is not acceptable, but there's still this odd kind of mystical admiration that you can get from a lot of Western movies for Native Americans. I feel like that's the beginning of the, 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 the hippie aesthetic worship of, of Eastern, Eastern uh, religion and mysticism. You can almost see that, right? It's almost the beginning of it. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's very common, you know, it, it means very common people talk about, um, you know, white people all over the United States want to think they're Native American. 
there's a there's a chapter in Vine Deloria's book uh, Custer Died for Your Sins where he talks about how millions of Americans have this family story about how they're actually descended from an Indian princess and she died in a tragic way and they're writing letters to Native American tribes asking if they can give them evidence of their great ancestor and that that white Americans in the Midwest in like the 1950s and 60s all wanted to claim they were Native Americans so as much as there is a racist stereotype there's also this weird like Native Americans are these noble you know these noble savages i guess you could say to borrow from voltaire but this they have this image of native americans that's very racist and very stereotypical but it's also kind of admiring them and that feeds into the new left's kind of primitivism the left has always emphasized historical progress but you get from the hippie thing like oh if we could go back to being the way the native americans are if we could go back to the way tibet was before those communists came in there that beautiful shangri-la kingdom you know uh you know, I mean, it, it, it's very interesting. And I feel like something about the way Native Americans are oddly portrayed and depicted in Westerns points to something about the new left, but also about the weirdness of the American mindset. Well, I think there's an element that they're made into the other. And the West is informed uh, prior to the 70s, earlier films, the early novels, uh, by optimism, maybe more optimism than confidence that... You know, there are people that regret the project on some level. They find America a god that failed and mm -hmm. the other. And, and in terms of the political economy and race, I got the impression that, you know, I think Jefferson had some semi-progressive things to say about Native people, some. Hmm, but really? he, did, he certainly did not about African Americans. And I, I think you see this pattern in a lot of countries where uh, uh, if a certain people are subdued enough and marginal enough that they can kind of become something for the imagination of the bourgeoisie, African Americans could not in a certain time period uh, because of how they fit into the political economy. They had to be classified in a kind of denigrated way, as a denigrated uh, form of humanity, if even humanity. And Native Americans, they were not at a certain point fearing revolution from Native Americans right. or not, you know, so the, the, we're getting a, you know, a subjugated people becomes a kind of entertainment in a way that's non-threatening. Right, and that started with the Buffalo Bill shows and, and such. And, you know, one point that must be made, and I, I feel like you can't talk about Westerns without talking about this, is that they're dead. I mean, they don't, I mean, they made a remake of The Magnificent Seven a few years ago, but they don't make Westerns anymore. Western movies just don't happen. It's the weakest genre, as far as I could tell at this point. And I strongest. think that points to the United States becoming weaker and more divided and more culturally confused. Because that Western mythology that was with us from, like, the 1800s up until, like, the 90s is gone. You know? And I think that that points toward a cultural shift. The fact that the myth of the West isn't there. Now, you've talked about the role of that Mel Brooks movie, uh, Blazing Saddles. Which I think flawed in some ways if you're going to analyze it in a high-minded way but has elements that are very <laughs> serious and very powerful well I, I think so i think there's there's some very powerful uh there, it's deconstruction but it's impressive deconstruction in some sure. ways. sure i mean right instead of the pioneers being these noble hard-working people they're a bunch of racist ignorant fools right i mean that's there's that right the politicians are corrupt and selling things off you know, I mean, it's it's in every way, it's it's a deconstruction of this 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 idea that the the Wild West was this glorious thing, and he's doing it as a spoof, as a comedy, as like a lampoon, so he can get away with it. It's not like you know, uh, it's not a Howard Zinn book. He's not sitting there with you know Howard Zinn and going, actually, there were lots of Native Americans who were killed. Actually, there were a lot of lynchings. Actually, you know, he's not doing that. He's he's just lampooning and kind of and it points toward the fact, the fact that everyone laughed at that movie. Is because everyone kind of knew that on some level. That's why that movie has survived. People still love that movie decades, decades later. People love it. And it's because people, people all along, they kind of knew that that cowboy thing wasn't real. Well, the end, you, you have the epic score, and they're riding the, the heroes of the movie, Gene uh, Wilder. I forget the name of the other actor. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 you know, I don't know him from other movies particularly well. Yeah. But they're riding the horse, horses, and they... They go up to um, maybe it's a Lincoln Town car, very nice, expensive car, because at the end of the day, they're actors in a movie. Yeah. And Americans have had a hard time coping with that message. Uh, John Wayne was an actor, but a lot of people 
he was primarily a cowboy war hero too, but he he almost was these things to American people. Right. There's nothing like that today, good or bad. You know, there's nothing with that much mystique. Right. You know. Well, it must be said that John Wayne, in addition to being the cowboy actor, he was the war propagandist. He made every World War II movie, The Sands of Iwo Jima, and, you know, all of that. And he made an awful, awful film called The Green Berets to promote the Vietnam War. Um, it has a, a catchy theme tune. I always liked the music. But I've seen it, a bit of that on TV as a kid. It was kind of... You, you know, you, it's kind of cringy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, you can't... Well, I tried to watch it, and, I, and it was like, I it wasn't... I thought it would be laughable, like the politics would just be laughable, but it was just... It was violent, and it was hard to... Like, it, like the politics weren't even there. It was just kind of blood and gore and shooting, and, you know, I... But the fact that the, the key cowboy actor is also the key war propagandist, I think that's not an accident. No. Um, not at all. And that shows how well-connected the cowboy myth with the myth of American empire and, and war. I mean, it's, it's psychologically, it's, they're, they're joined together. This is not the Pentagon planning. This is just the, the nat this is the psyche of yeah, the country. Of course. It, it's, there's, uh, I, I mean, in America, I, I've heard, I remember Chomsky talking about like, you see uh, for colonial projects that America would be supportive of, you see a language used that it takes on, it's often, the language of the West is often been projected onto international relations in surprising ways, and there's a record of this. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think even like um, the funny one I heard that like the Cossacks in American American journalists would talk about them as Apache. Hmm. <laughs> you know, because the, the, every, America see through the lens of this. They had like a similar hair knot apparently, huh. but like the Czar unleashed the Apache. On the revolution, you know, they, they, and this kind of stuff is not rare. Not now, because this, 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 the psychic well has dried up, as far as I can tell. But for decade upon decade upon decade, this, this kind of lens, Americans, I think, I think the most powerful people in America saw the world through this lens. Well, if there's any culture in the world that is very, very much like that whole cowboy myth that we have in the USA, it's the Yemenis. Right? I mean, if you look at the Houthis, right? The Houthi rebels, I mean, their real name is the Ansarullah group, the Ansarullah organization, you know. They always are waving guns around at their rallies. Well, people don't know the reason that they do that is they interpret the Quran as saying that every man must, is obligated to own a firearm um, or, a, or a sword or a, or a weapon to protect his household. Right? This sounds similar. I don't know why and, Sikhs always have a sword, but I remember, don't Sikhs always have a blade of some kind? Yeah, and like Yemen, I mean, this is a, a very, you know, it's a desert country. They're out there in the desert. They're on their own. They, you know, they've got their rifles and, you know, and they're fighting off the foreign king and, and a man's house is his castle. And this very, very kind of, you know, it's, it's a very similar mindset that they have in Yemen. You know, it's, it's very much, you know, this is a Bedouin culture. Uh, uh, you know, of people that, you know, it very much fits almost the myth of the West. I mean, you can see the, the Houthis, if you want, um, the Houthis and Surah Allah, you can see them almost like, you know, like the cowboys. It would be like the cowboys of the Old West fighting the British Empire invading again or something. It, it's very much that mindset. And that the Houthis are like, hey, we're Shia, we're in the North, we want to do our own thing. You all are Sunni in the South. You want to do your own thing. Some of you are communists in the Southern movement. You want to do and reestablish the Southern Yemen, the Democratic People's Republic of Yemen uh, that existed. And some of you, and it's kind of like we're all just going to kind of do our own thing here. We don't all have the same religion, but we all don't like the foreigners coming in here and messing with us. I mean, you look at the the Houthi movement. You look at Ansar Allah. They're cowboys. I mean, this is this is like something straight out of a cowboy movie. It's fascinating. Well, that's the thing. I think. It's a kind of a selective thing, but the difference between the cowboy and the idea of the noble savage isn't about techniques, per mm -hmm. se. It, exactly. It's sort of like, basically, I think what, what the way people have, like, movements around the world, people would view them as static and primitive and not the West, because there's a kind of Hegelian idea of progress mm. in the frontier that, that was kind of always a part, that they were going there... And they were going to transition to a higher form of civilization. That the idea of the John Wayne figure, others, they were rough, but they were vital. And that vitality was going to be a source of civilization. They were violent, 
but you know, if you know the Bible, the first murderer is the first founder of a city. Mm -hmm. And you know, this, this was something that I think is there. And again, it's, we're at a point where we can't believe in this. And I think the imagination of liberalism is kind of dry and it can't give people, it can give people consumer experiences like the superhero movie, but it can't give people mythos. Right. And I mean, you can see in the whole cowboy thing, it's a, a sanitized version of the settler stuff that was coming out of Victorian England. Right. I mean, the settler stuff, right. It's like cruelty is good. Uh, right. Survival of the fittest. Uh, you know, um, you know, we're going out to the wild land and and a lot of the stuff that you see with like the settlers of Rhodesia. Right. Uh, which now is Zimbabwe, the settlers of South Africa, the settlers of Australia, a lot of that same kind of Victorian, you know, we're going to go out there and we're going to be mean and we're going to be cruel and we're going to, you know, teach people how to do things. And we're going to be we're going to try to suppress the parts of ourselves that are empathetic and compassionate and try to be more mean because we're, you know, that's how history moves forward. It's through being mean and being tough. That kind of that kind of mentality, you can see that in Westerns, but it's a little more sanitized. It's not as ugly as it is with the British Empire. It's not, uh, you know, they're not talking about the white man's burden and, you know, they're, you know, I mean, they're, you know, it's a little more sanitized. But you can see certain themes. Everyone having a gun. Settlers always wanted to have guns in case the natives come and attack. you got to have your gun, whether in Rhodesia or Australia or in Omaha. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, there's that same... Same mindset, you know, there's kind of the, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that, that, you know, people are on their own, kind of, it's not like a whole nation, we're not a nation together, we're not a one people, it's kind of like, I have my house, leave me alone, let me do my own thing, let me carve out my little place of land. Um, you know, you can see kind of the, you know, the, the toughness, um, you know, the, you know, the corporal punishment and the, you know, beating people and, you know, the people need, you know, more discipline and, you know, and the, the kind of celebration of the patriarchal figure, right, you have your little little isolated piece of land that's all yours but you know there's a family there but it's headed by a father figure who's kind of you know strong and has a gun and you know you can see all of that in that's just settler stuff you know it just happens that in the united states hollywood was there and it got you know global uh but this is all just settler stuff that you see everywhere right no i think that's about right if i meet uh, i work i work at a job where i meet quite a few people and if i meet people from uh south africa so often i will meet someone that and they even it's, wear cowboy hats, right? Yes. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's... Any of those countries, not everyone, but there are people who fit that. And there's a tension in life. Uh, people of that mold who, who aspire to be that, you know, the world today in industrialized societies, post-industrial, um, you may want to, you know, raise your children by the laws of like Kyrgyz or something in like Sparta, but it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. If you're in a multicultural office, maybe more women than men, this whole thing, you know, the law of Sparta and the, and the ancestry of the things in that spirit, it's, it's not working. And, it, the, and these people, in a way, they know they're a minority. They can, uh, in America, they may mm -hmm. like, they still like Bill O'Reilly's not on Fox News. I think those people still watch him. Mm -hmm. And they have, they have multiple niche channels, I think, on TV that are like all Westerns. So there's like there's a there's a place for you for the next 15 years until you die in your 70s mm -hmm. or 80s, but there isn't a world for that, and so it's like if you're gonna bring your children up like that, what what world are you gonna give them? Because they know they don't have a world. That, you know, I think the right and people of a mentality aligned with the right, they know they've lost that battle mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah, and so there's like it doesn't seem to have much of a future. Right. In not in the given social structure, maybe in a coming anarchy, there'll be some spaces for that. I, I don't know. Indeed. Well, on that note, I think we're going to wrap up, but it's always a pleasure to have you on, George. Same. Always fun. I think this was an interesting discussion. Mm, agreed.